to any African that was ever born, to all Africans who will ever be born, to all that is African. I share. One last thing. If there are those who do not want us to come into who we are, if there are those who think badly about what we are saying today, let their evilness turn back on them. Let it go away. This is part of the tradition of pouring libation. Let it take them to some other place and leave us in peace to learn this evening. Ashe. Things of the West. We have our ancestors here with us. I know I feel strong and we all of us here feel stronger to listen to our brother tonight. It is an honor, a pleasure, and with love that I'm introducing Dr. Wade Nobles to you. The brother really does not need an elaborate introduction because we all heard him and we know the kind of work that he's doing for us. African peoples. Tonight, you heard him today on WLIB. Yesterday evening, others heard him in New Jersey. Tonight, before he leaves us tomorrow and goes back to the West where he's doing equally important work, where the struggle is still on, you're going to sit back and listen to him tonight. Tonight, he's going to talk about and something that is extremely important to us, to our children, and to children yet to come. He's going to talk about education. Education, the sort of African cultural content and intent. He's going to talk about, and you know that we are at war. The war is on, particularly with education. They do not want us to educate our young children the way they should be educated. They want to keep on this question, this attitude of shutting them out. And you read the papers yesterday, those horrible things they call papers, you've read them, and you can see my, the sentence is open war with them. Dr. Nobles really, as I said, needs very little introduction. You know, he's one of the most prominent persons in the field of black psychology. You cannot go any better than the African brother in black psychology. Psychology is extremely necessary, especially for creating the kind of children we want to take the mantle in the years to come, in the next century. Because we as African peoples must take the mantle. There's something, the importance of African psychology. In his book, which I always keep near me and I'm always referring to when I have a spare time, there are many books I keep around me, and I'm always going back to them to get the kind of spirit and the life and the encouragement to keep on this struggle. And something that was said, you will see how necessary that we need brothers like Dr. Nobles with us because they are intent on destroying our children. Something that Dr. Nobles quotes and uses in his book here that is something that is almost frightening when you read about it. Something that someone said about educating our children. But I'm not going to read it. I'm going to allow him to come and talk to you. And it is with that spirit, the spirit that we have to rescue our children and make sure they get included in the kind of education that we want for them. The education is going to make them future African men and women, not only to save themselves, but save the continent of Africa. And it is in that spirit, also a fighting spirit, that I introduce <coughs> our well-loved brother, Dr. Wade Noble.
It is clearly a, an honor to always come to Harlem. I was thinking that, uh, that maybe Harlem is, for me, uh, the place that I must go to at least once a year, like the salmon do when they go to, back home to spawn. Uh, because uh, uh, even though I am brought here to, in one sense, teach, it is here that I learn, and, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a magical spiritual learning because I always come with my training, with my little notes, and I'm prepared to, to share my recent thoughts. But somehow, Harlem Africans give me stuff that comes from you, so I, I preface my remarks with, uh, I hope I comprehend well what you teach me tonight and, um, and, and reflect it back to you. Um, it is in that context that I, I, I want to put Kenty in front of me and, and the fetish that is my personal uh, will to draw the ancestral spirits to my, to my heart and to begin uh, this conversation because it is purely a conversation uh, that hopefully I will be coherent and, and share with you some ideas. I must, as, as, as you who know me, begin by asking personal permission from my elders to speak and to teach. And if I may, we were talking about eldership on the way over. Do I have your permission to speak? Yes, you do. Then it, it, it is critical that, that we always begin with the acknowledgement of the, the living source uh, of, of our wisdom, and that clearly is our elder. And so with your permission, I ask you all to allow me to assume a posture of reverence and respect while I say out loud that I give praise and credit to the source of all knowledge and all truth. And I do that by saying that the Almighty, who is sometimes called Amun, and is sometimes called Ptah, and is sometimes called Jehovah, and is sometimes called Obatula, and is sometimes called the Christ, and is sometimes called Shango, and is sometimes called Allah, and is sometimes called Ola Tamari, that Almighty God, Amun, Ptah, Ra, although hidden, is the source of all knowledge, all truth, and all wisdom. And I pray that in what I share with you tonight, that Amun, Tehuti, Orumila, will be satisfied. I am going to try to talk about uh, the war, because we are now in the process of reclaiming and establishing our own selves as the authors of the education of African children. And there is clearly a force and a faction that see it is to their vested interest to keep us believing that education is a neutral and independent and objective concert that anybody with good intention can do. And the fact of the matter is that education is a very concise, very specific issue, and it has to be driven by clear analysis and clear definition. And what I hope to do tonight is to share with you some of the definitions and some of the analysis that I think are important as we engage in educational excellence for African children. So I want to talk about culture, obviously, but I want to talk about culture as the content of education and, and probably even more importantly, culture as the intent of education. Because a lot of folk want to talk about cultural content and how do we infuse, include, apply the culture of African folk into the educational enterprise. Few people want to address the more serious question, which is what is the intention of education when it comes to African American people. See, academic excellence, and, and there are folk who who we all know, like, like, like Dr. Ben and Asa Hilliard and, and Professor Clark, who, who helped us to see that academic excellence cannot be reached. And we're all talking about, I mean, black mothers and fathers are all talking about, we want our children to succeed in education. We know that is an important enterprise. But what, what we have seen that's very clear is that academic excellence, the fact that our children get an A or a B or that they're on some kind of honors program, what we see as academic excellence can never be achieved without cultural excellence. That's the rule, that academic excellence can never be achieved without cultural excellence. And so we have to raise the question of our culture 
as the engine, as the energy that drives the educational experience. And we have to look at our culture as a thing that informs those components of the educational experience that are important. But to break down things that we just talk and words that we just use that we haven't bothered to define from our own spirit. Like if education is about transmitting knowledge, what is knowledge? What is the purpose of knowledge? In fact, what is education? What is the purpose of education? Let me share with you as a, as, as a possible contribution that we begin to look at the purpose of knowledge from an Afro and Afrocentric perspective is that knowledge is the stuff that we utilize to liberate ourselves from the restrictive limits of the society we find ourselves in. So that requires that we understand what are the things that make, that are the restrictions in our society. And clearly in, in the United States, the fundamental restriction is not economics, it is not your class status, it is not where you live, it is not that you can't live in a certain community, but the real fundamental restriction in this society is a psychological the real fundamental restriction is that racism and oppression exist because they utilize psychology as a way of hiding themselves from the real deal. And so we spend a great deal of time struggling with civil rights motion. Do we get our, do we get our in quote, piece of the pie? And not realize that in getting the piece of the pie, it is a psychological pie, and it is the mentality that once we got the pie and we eat it, we don't even realize that we are poisoning ourselves. Oh, we are inflicting ourselves. <laughs> so, so knowledge has to knowledge has to liberate us yes. from the restrictive limits of a society. So now when we go to the schoolhouse or we go to the school board or we go to a curriculum package, we can begin to ask by criteria, how does this stuff, this curriculum, these teaching methodologies, whatever, how do those things help African children to be liberated from the psychological oppression of being in a society whose philosophy, whose value system, whose social structures are designed to be antithetical to the well-being and the welfare of the African spirit. So we have a criteria, so it's real clear now, we can ask some very pertinent questions. Knowledge also has to simultaneously, why it liberates us, and this is important because sometimes psychological liberation means that you get into a world of fantasy. And so we imagine ourselves, uh, we imagine, or we spend a great deal of time imagining what it must have been like when Africans ruled the world. We imagine that as, a, as something in our minds and not as a responsibility for us to do today. So, 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 so the knowledge has to not only allow us to, to fly through the imagination to liberate ourselves from the restrictive limits, but it also has to help us to maintain contact with the perceptible and the ponderable universe. The perceptible, meaning you see this stuff. I'm trying not to use my favorite word because Brother Bill said I use it too much, so I'm going to change the stuff. It has an S. It's the same thing, right? So we, so we have to, we have to, uh, so Brother Bill, you see you got me in my mind here. You can work in my mind about maybe I shouldn't use my favorite word, but I didn't tell you, it was my father's favorite word. And so, so he gave it to me and it was clear to me that it was useful. Uh, because whenever he used it, I understood the spirit of what he was talking about. So, um, so I'm going to switch up a little bit and hope it doesn't, 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 doesn't hamper me. Hope it doesn't become a restrictive limit <laughs> on my ability to, 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 to share with you this concept of knowledge. The perceptible universe means those things that we can really see. It is the material world that we can see. It is the kind of concrete conditions that we see in Harlem, that we see in every single black community everywhere in the world, not just in the United States. So we are struggling with real concrete things that we can see the perceptible universe and, the, and what, what the ancestors say, the ponderable universe. The universe that you can think about, think reasonably about and systematically about. So we have to begin to talk about how knowledge allows us to fly, liberating us from the restrictive limits, but also to walk on real earth so that we understand the contact with the real earth about what the real deal is in terms of African children uh, in the educational process. Education then becomes the next 
concept that we have to struggle with because we don't know what it means, then when we call for relevant education, we don't know it when we get it. So we talk about relevant education, we have to know what education is in order for, we, for us to have an ability to evaluate whether it's relevant or not. The purpose of education that our ancestors set down, that allowed us to see is that the purpose of education is really to allow a people, not an individual, to allow a people to systematically guide the reproduction and refinement of the best of themselves. You hear me? It is to reproduce and refine who you are. So when we talk about relevant education, it is relevant only to the extent that it allows African people to reproduce and refine the best of what it is to be African. Here's a criteria now. We can begin to look at educational systems and ask ourselves, how does this educational system, how do these curriculum packages, how do these teaching strategies, how does this whole set of pedagogical reasoning allow me to reproduce the best that is African? to refine, because every generation has to get better at this stuff. How do we allow ourselves to reproduce and refine the best of ourselves? So with those two criteria, then we can begin to look and examine kind of carefully what the role of education has been relative to our culture. Obviously, I make the argument that the knowledge and the education has to be driven by our culture, that the whole question of liberation the whole question of, 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 of pondering and perceiving the world has to be done through African eyes. Right. And those African eyes are, are driven by our culture. So the question that, we, that I want to address is, let's look at what has happened in terms of the, the question of culture in the educational experience. And what we in fact see is that mainstream, and so you know who I'm talking about, mainstream American educators and scholars have attempted for a long time to render culture as irrelevant to education, and that culture was not important, and that really belonged in that discipline called anthropology, and at some point you would study anthropology in order to understand culture, and what you really did was study the distortions that European anthropologists created from their own psychological aberrancy that said that what was interesting about a people is the exotica of the people. And so they ran around looking at, could they find some bare breast somewhere? They went around looking around, can they find some strange kind of exotic behavior somewhere? And talked about that as the discipline of anthropology, but more importantly, as their explication of what was culture. And so, so then culture got removed from the educational process, and we failed to see that culture is the educational process. And, but but, the, the, but, but the, the problem is that we've allowed folk, and, and really we didn't allow it, we sort of walked into this stuff. See, I said stuff, Brother Bill. <laughs> I said stuff, Brother Bill. We walked into this stuff um, unknowingly, unknowingly, and, and began to be involved in the same debate that they set up. And so they began to argue on some kind of cultural chauvinism that, that there were some cultures that were deviant, and that these cultures were deviant, therefore the purpose of education is to try to replace these deficient mm -hmm. cultural orientations. And so, so, so African folk became the evidence of this deviant culture. And what they saw through their, through their need for seeing exotica was that the style, the rhythms, the methodologies of African people were deviancies, and they had to be corrected. And so education became a process of trying to educate or to correct African people. Uh, the educational agenda became how do you make us something different because what we had naturally was, was deviant. The second part of, 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 of this kind of cultural uh, chauvinism was to argue that the, the issue of education, issue of culture wasn't important at all and that in fact we had no culture, uh, that African people had no culture and so what we had to do was to somehow give us some culture. And so culture became the stuff that you acquired once you got sophisticated. And culture was symbolized by the fact that when you drank tea, you put your pinky up in the air. And, uh, and that was culture. So, so they made us believe that that was a culture. And we tried it for a while, but, and we tried it. We felt foolish. And so 
we decided that culture wasn't important. See the, you see the trick here? That when they made culture that kind of behavioral manifestation, and we went and tried it, it didn't feel right. And so we said, this ain't about nothing. <laughs> and so we gave that up. We said, culture ain't important. And so we walked into this analysis that allowed us to, 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 to fail to see that all the, the, the real failure of our children in the educational experience was because it wasn't driven by the authenticity and the purity of our culture. The culture is not, and this is the, the final thing that the, that, that the mainstream educators did, they decided, well, if culture is important, then we got to sort of put it in the schools and, and be fair and be liberal about it. And so they started a, a kind of a, of, a, of a gumbo soup educational experience where they would uh, put culture in like they're sprinkling it in the gumbo. And so they would say that culture was like, you had to add some stuff to what we were doing because we being them. What we're doing is the main thing, and that's the main menu. And if you put some red beans in it, then it would be black. If you put some tomatoes in it, then it would be black. And so they started sprinkling in, and the whole educational process became one of you could put up some black heroes and heroines on the wall. Then you had relevant culture in the classroom. Uh, culture is not, and this is important, culture is not simply the compilation of a list of heroes and holidays of a people. Our heroes and heroines and our holy days are important, but they don't comprise the whole thing of culture. Culture has to do with an understanding of the energy of a people. And if we don't understand that, we won't, which I'll talk about in a moment, we won't understand how culture shapes our identity. And it's the identity that is the issue that has to come about. But folk ran around for a long time trying to talk about um, culture as that add-on stuff, that putting in sprinkling stuff, trying to figure out the holidays, trying to figure out how they can bring rap music into the classroom to teach English because that's part of the culture of black folk. I understand that that's not a bad strategy to, to use that kind of relevant medium for educating black kids, but for to argue that that's our culture is to in fact insult us. Yeah. So we have to begin to look at this question, and from my position and my vantage point, I think we have to stop the process and define for them what we mean by culture. Because if we don't define what we mean by culture, then we cannot have a criteria for assessing whether or not they're on target, or whether for that matter we are on target. Because we run around getting, going to the black bookstore and getting stuff and bringing it in and putting the posters up and thinking we're doing something uh, for our kids. And therefore, they say, well, shoot. I mean, shoot. <laughs> Maybe I should mark it down, Brother Bill, and come up in. See, if, I, if, if I mark them down and I don't get to seven of them, then I'm all right. But if I go beyond seven, so someone keeps going. Cool. Um, what, what we do is begin to think that we're doing the same thing. And when they look at us, and see that the black educator is doing the same thing that they're doing, they don't see that the black educator is the, is the victim of their racism and, racism and is acting out as a clone, their same stuff, they say this is justification for what they're doing. They say, hey, black folks are doing this stuff, so it must be right. And I realize that the poor black person is doing it, is doing the best he can as a victim of the same racism that they are the perpetrators of. So we have to begin to analyze this thing very carefully and have criteria that allow us to assess and to judge whether or not we're on the right track. I want to suggest to you that, that, that culture is to humans as water is to fish. And we never see fish running around saying, hey, I'm in water. Hey, I'm in water. This water's cold. This water's hot. The fish don't do that kind of stuff. And humans don't run around really saying, hey, I'm in culture. But the analysis is clear. If you take a saltwater fish and put the saltwater fish in fresh water, the saltwater fish has a problem. All kinds of things happen. The saltwater fish starts moving at a different rhythm, walking stiff or swimming stiff. Uh, the saltwater fish coloration starts to change. The saltwater fish interest in who it should mate with starts to change. The saltwater fish sees the schooling the schooling of its lifestyle, you know, fish swim in schools. The saltwater fish sees the, the swimming in the school as not important and breaks off and tries to be an individual. And then, and then the saltwater fish starts having problems and goes to 
the freshwater fish and ask the freshwater fish, can they get a freshwater psychologist to help the saltwater fish understand what it is to be a saltwater fish? And if, if there is no intervention, if there's no intervention, the saltwater fish that is in fresh water ultimately dies. And so we have to either help the, the water be more compatible to the saltwater fish if we want the saltwater fish to live in that new environment. I don't need to make the analysis about what happens when Africans find themselves living in non-African water. It is clear. It is clear. And so what we have to begin to do is to talk about the nature of the water. Because you can't change the nature of the saltwater fish. You can't change the nature of the African. You have to make the water satisfy the conditions of the African. You can't do the other way. And what we've been doing is trying to make the African different so that we would survive in a different environment. And that has failed us. We have to change the environment. And the environment that is important for us is those institutions that are critical, the family, the educational system, the workplace, the church place. All those are structural institutions that are designed to be the ingredients of the water that we find ourselves swimming in. Culture is to humans as water is to fish. We have to begin to look at that. Culture, more technically, because that was sort of a nice little, that's the, the kindergarten level, right? That's the thing that we can take home and remember because it's cute. But, but, but we have to be real serious because this is a, a serious proposition. Culture, more technically, is the vast structure of behaviors, ideas, attitudes, values, habits, beliefs, customs, language, rituals, ceremonies, practices peculiar to a particular group of people. Yeah and which gives them a general design for living and patterns for interpreting reality. It is in the patterns of interpreting reality that culture becomes important. It is in the educational process that we tell the next generation, here's how you should see the world. Here are the patterns that are perceptible and ponderable. And if that is not driven by an Afrocentric philosophy, then the perceptible and ponderable universe will not be consistent with the fish. You understand with the fish. So we have to begin to look at those general designs for living and patterns for interpreting reality. Culture teaches the people to recognize phenomena. That's why black folks recognize some things that go shh to other people. We recognize when and why they can't see it. That's why, that's why black folk uh, get, white folk, in fact, white folk get concerned because we will react to certain statements. And they will say, we're just speaking the English language. Why are you getting all out of pocket? They don't use that word, but they will say, why do you get so concerned? And we say out of pocket because we speak symbolically and, and, and analogically. That's part of our culture. But they will say, why do you get upset when you know, you discussing issues of educating black kids? And, and they will say, well, what do you, what do you people want? Yeah. Brother, Brother Phil, we say, what kind of shit is this, you people? start doing all this stuff and they wonder where it comes from. And that is a cultural thing because culture gives you a general design for living and patterns for interpreting reality. And so the you that they say, that they state as a way of asking what is this group that's in front of me interested in doesn't become targeting for communicating to us but becomes that badge of their excluding themselves from the reality that is combined and so if they can exclude themselves, then we know that our vested interest is not protected. And so we say, what do you mean by this use stuff? You and this stuff too. And so we try to bring them back in it and struggle that way. And then it becomes, well, you all need what? A salt water psychologist to help you work through interpersonal relationships. And so they get us off track. We figure we just don't know how to negotiate. We don't know how to communicate. We don't know how to, to, to talk with folk, and we got to figure out strategies for communication, and we therefore get out of our own cultural fabric and forget and don't understand that once you're out of your own cultural fabric, you can never win anything. You can never achieve anything. And so, so, so we begin to understand these things. The culture gives meaning to reality. Culture allows us to see the logical relationships between things. It's all defined 
by culture. Culture, in fact, allows us to, to understand how, in fact, the educational achievement and motivation issues are tied to the engine that drives our children. It's not that these kids are uh, empty vessels that some people want to talk about, empty vessels that you've got to pour information in and then test them based upon whether they comprehend information, but our culture says that you have to bring out of the child its natural genius. There's a different cultural orientation. So in the classroom, I think you, you're an empty vessel, I gotta put something in you, or I think that your family has contaminated you, so I gotta take out of you the stuff that your family put in you, and then put something back into you called education, whereas our culture says no, that the child comes from God. Right. with a natural gift and talent, and it's my responsibility to identify that and bring it out of the child, to develop it, to flourish it. And so when we address the question of education, it becomes important to see that education, as well as the issues of curriculum and teaching, et cetera, that are part of education, are all cultural phenomena. There, are no, there is no education that is acultural. When we send our children to school, we're sending them to an enculturation experience. If we don't understand that they're being enculturated and not being educated, then we fail our children. Culture becomes a critical thing. Culture is, is in fact, uh, the stuff that allows us to, to drive, to inspire education. It is not the, 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 the add-on stuff. It's not heroes and holidays. It's not, a people's, it's not just the people's music and people's dance, so we try that, we figure, well, we get some black music or some African music, or we get something, then we get culture. Uh, or we find times when we decide that these are the holy days that are important to say that folks, are, uh, the culture should be recognized and respected. So right now, it's February, all over the country. Everybody's saying black folk are exotic again. You know, so you got, you got black folk being important. I mean, Chinese people are running around talking about black folk being interesting uh, because it's, it's February. And you can see that, you know, that, that uh, it, this country does that for all ethnic groups. I mean, there's a point where, you know, Chinese New Year, and the Chinese people get important. They're important. They run around trying to figure out what's that dragon stuff about and why they run into the street with them candles and blowing blow up from firecrackers. And that becomes the, the new exotic for their moment in time. Or uh, you look at men, and everybody starts talking about single to mile, and people throwing hats on the floor and running around, dancing around hats, talking about they into a Mexican thing or a Hispanic thing. Not realizing those ain't the stuff that makes folk have culture, but that's not, those are just the manifestations and some of the, some of the more simplistic rituals of a people's culture. And we have to see education as far more than uh, the seasoning process. And now, now I'm going to use that term kind of, kind of advisedly. Because at one time, certain folk felt that they had to season the African yes. in order to make him or her compatible with a system of slavery. Right. Today, people believe they have to season the educational experiences with the foolishness, or at least the, the unimportant aspects of our culture in order to make our culture more compatible mm -hmm with their interest as educators. The seasoning aspect is always there. So we have to begin to look at these commonalities, these patterns, to see what happens. The, the educational experiences of, of black children cannot be seasoning soul food. It has to be how do you manage the educational experience of a culturally distinct population. And it is in our cultural, cultural distinction that we address the question that every aspect of education is cultural. That the culture question raises the notion that if you talk about curriculum, some places, some states have a core curriculum that all children are supposed to go through. The fact of the matter is that the core curriculum or the curriculum in the school is a cultural issue. If you talk about teaching methodology, how do you teach effectively in the classroom? That's a cultural question. If you talk about the site leadership at a schoolhouse or school place, that's a cultural question. If you talk about how you deal with guidance and counseling and those few children get off the path and start doing some aberrant or deviant stuff and you want to bring them back onto, in quote, the no normality and you involve them in guidance and counseling issues, that's a cultural question. If you look at instruction, uh, instructional strategies, that's a cultural question. You look at school climate, you know, this, this society has been raising up black men as heroes because they took the school climate and made it better by having a bat and a bullhorn and running around beating up on black kids and saying that that is educational pedagogy when in fact that was a cultural question. The school climate is a cultural question. And finally, the, the aim and the purpose of education are cultural questions. 
It is in the aim and the purpose of education that we address the issue of cultural content and cultural intent. Both have to go together. We spend a great deal of time now because it's, uh, it may even be fashionable or acceptable talking about cultural content. How can we get all that stuff that the, the, you know, the great black minds have scratched and dug up about African contributions and maybe include that in the education experience, but there's even a battle about whether you include that. If you want to debate about the fact that do you include uh, African content in the education experience, they're not at, at all ready to deal with how do you include the African intent in the education experience. Because the African intent targets us directly to the point of education is the systematic reproduction and refinement of the best of ourselves. That's the intent of education. But if I can look just very quickly at the cultural content question, I think it's important because that's the first step. We need to begin to talk about, specifically in terms of uh, the purpose of curricula, is to begin to analyze and look at what is curricula. Again, I have to drop back because I'm, I'm, I'm elementary and, and, and naive about these things. So I have to, you know, when people start talking, I say, well, what is it? You talk about curriculum, well, what is it? You have me speaking this language and running around talking about I'm a, a curricular expert. Well, what is it that you're talking about? Because I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. And once you get them to ask the question, what is it, and you break it down, then we can see whether it fits our image and our interest, whether it is conducive to us. And when I begin to look at that and ask what is curricular, what I, what I find is that curricular is a, is a, is a systematic system guide, to, guide that allows you to transmit information and knowledge to somebody. That's one aspect of curriculum. So it's a bunch of stuff, it's a set of knowledge that we're going to transmit to the next generation. Curricula also should or supposed to, supposed to reinforce in the, in the learner the desire to learn. You see, so one thing we talk about, we talk about curriculum, we're looking at what's the, what's the information. We spend a lot of time talking about what's the information. And so we're debating whether or not it is good information to, to talk about uh, Columbus discovering the America, or to talk about the, the best example is not Columbus. The best example is that we use um, uh, heroes to try to establish principles. So we teach the principle of honesty by telling children that George Washington never told a lie. <laughs> Look at the contradiction. We we teach in honesty by telling a lie. Yeah. The fact of the matter is that, he, that to say he never told a lie is a lie. And so how can you teach the principle of honesty by by showing that you're a liar? You see, so, so the issue of education is not just the, I mean, curriculum is not just the content, but it's also this invisible stuff which has to do with the principles of conduct, and, and that inspires the child to learn. So, it's the, it, so it, curriculum has to reinforce the desire to learn. How do you spark in our children the desire to learn? We psychologists, at least we Afri African psychologists say, the way you, 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 you spark the desire to learn is that I see myself in the stuff. If I look in the mirror and see myself, that excites me. That excites me. And so when I look into the educational process, if I don't see my own image, then I'm not, I don't have a desire for it. You know, when you see the reflection of blackness, there's desire. There's desire. And so you educate children by showing them themselves in what it is that they are supposed to internalize. That's the reason, that's the value, that's the importance of having African cultural content in the curricula. Because when the black child, the black boy, the black girl interacts with that curricula and sees himself or herself, then there's desire. And that's one of the aspects of curricula. The third thing that curricula should do or is supposed to do is to encourage in the learner the internalization of the behavior and the principles that underlie the curriculum. Right. You know, that's what the, sometimes they try to relegate to civics class, that you want to teach people how to be a good American. But it ain't really about that. It's about that in the interaction with certain body of knowledge, you internalize that knowledge, but in internalizing the knowledge, you also internalize the attitudes mm -hmm. that are associated with the actors right. relative to the knowledge. So if I don't see black actors, mm -hmm. if I don't see black phenomena, then I can't internalize black behavior, black attitudes. If all I see in the curricula is white folk or non-African folk, then I, inter I do internalize. What I internalize is non-African behavior, non-African 
attitudes. And so the, so the critical thing in terms of curricula is to understand uh, that we must infuse it. We must infuse it, include in it our image and our interest. And that is clear, and it's, and it's really a relatively easy task. If you look at the issues of, of anything from mathematics, and they like to take mathematics <laughs> and science. and said, we ain't got no black mathematics. You know, one and one is two. We ain't got no black science. I mean, it wasn't no black thing that causes a rocket ship to go to Jupiter. Uh, and so how can you talk about a black thing when it comes to, to mathematics? And we have to, in fact, begin to refer to the fact that when you look at all the, 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 the personalities that created the foundations for mathematical reasoning, their spirits were African. Yes. And that in their African energy, they were able to what? Perceive the world in a certain way. Yeah. Remember, culture gives you a general design for living and patterns for interpreting reality. So those men and women who begin to lay down the foundations of mathematics, who were in fact and indeed African, perceive the world in a certain kind of way. It is that part of mathematics that is black that we have to understand. We can also point out to them that, uh, that in ancient Kemet, at the point where, 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 where the Greeks finally were able to, to, to impose their cultural orientation on Africa, as, uh, on Egypt, particularly in terms of language, that we found Africans writing and reasoning and thinking but not in the, in the ancient language of our, of our ancestors, but in Greek. Because Greek to come in and say, you won't speak Greek. The fact of the matter is that I'm standing in front of you right now speaking English. Hey, I'm not an Englishman, but I'm speaking English because of a historical experience of domination that forced me to give up my natural African language and speak English. And so now we, got, we look at the historical moment we got in Africa Africans who are developing the foundations for mathematics, but doing that through the medium of a Greek language. And so then they say, well, those are Greek. The fact of the matter is that one of the most important people in the field of mathematics was a blood named Euclid. Mm -hmm. Euclid lived in Alexandria. Alexandria is in Africa. Africa is where African people live. <laughs> <laughs> so baby logic says, wonder what Euclid was. <laughs> if Euclid was born there, he lived there, and he died there, I wonder what he was. The fact of the matter is that he was African, and that Euclid's importance in terms of mathematics is not that his logical arrangements of what's called the elements dominated the discipline of geometry for over 2,000 years, but that the general design for living and patterns for interpreting reality that drove Euclid's genius that was African dominated the field of mathematics yeah. for 2,000 years. Yeah. If you teach young black boys and girls that kind of analysis, then when they are approached with the issue of mathematics, it's in their pocket. It belongs to them. It is part of their nature. Yeah. That's infusing, infusing African content in the curricula. You can look at Arist uh, Aristophanes who, who lived in Libya. I don't know where Libya is. Oh, that's in Africa. Hmm. <laughs> Africa. Well, he was born in Africa. This brother literally was the first person to measure the circumference of the earth. Now think about that. He's doing this way back in, 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 in 300 BC. He measured the circumference of the earth without all the technology that we have today. If it wasn't for that black man, we would not be able to see all these shuttles going up in the space right now because of what? The cultural perception of a black man who was able to measure the circumference of the, of the earth and his measurements were seven-tenths of one percent in error. Blood did it without a rule and came up with just being off by an imperceptible margin. That we need to teach. So when a sister, little sister, is learning mathematics or dealing with that, if she can understand that relationship as part of the general design for living, then we have infused in the curriculum African content. And finally, if we look at folk like uh, Ptolemy. Ptolemy lived in Alexandria, lived in Africa. He was an algemist. Uh, and his tables of sines and cosines, and everybody knows, because I'm saying myself, I'm, I represent all black folk, 
that when I got to the sines and cosines part of mathematics, I was gone. I didn't know what that stuff was about, and I couldn't figure it out. And I was doing this with my fingers and trying to, trying to see all that stuff. But it's because what? There was no personal relationship or no image of myself in it. If I understood that that was an African equation, that I'm an African being, then I might have slid up to it a little closer because it was not something alien, it was going home. And when you go home, you relax. But, you, but we get blocks, we get literally mathematical blocks because that stuff is, is taught to us as belonging to somebody else. And then when it's complicated, we say, well, damn, if we belong to somebody else, it's complicated. Shit, let them have that stuff. And get them. <laughs> let, 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 we say, that's their thing. You see, now children begin saying, that's their thing. And then we, they excuse themselves from it because that ain't about them. So the infusing, the inclusion of African content is giving us the marriage of blackness to excellence. And once we do that, we inspire our children. We give them the desire to learn. A sister named Hypatia. Hypatia was such a bad sister. She was the chair, the chair of the Department of Philosophy at the University of Alexandria in 415 uh, AD. Now think about this. In 1990, name a black woman who's a chair in a department of philosophy anywhere. Go ahead. And she was doing it in 1415. <laughs> and was so bad that they couldn't figure out, because they, 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 they had a strange thing about tenure in those days. They couldn't figure out how to get rid of the system. They engaged in debate with her, and she beat them back. They engaged in trying to show that her qualifications weren't up to snuff. Like they do us now, they want to see whether you're an expert and where you get your degrees yeah. from. Same old stuff, they did that to her. And finally, she was so bad they couldn't do nothing legally to the sister that they had to actually stone her to death to remove her. They were so enraged by her excellence that they became rabid, vulgar animals and destroyed her rather than say, that her genius and her wisdom should be acknowledged and, uh, and, and, and praised. And we don't have to go way back. We can look at, in terms of mathematics, that African-American brothers have been, been doing this stuff. Benjamin Banneker, everybody talks about Benjamin Banneker. Benjamin Banneker was a mathematician, understood this stuff back in, 17, in the 1700s, uh, 1800s. Uh, Albert Francis Cox was a brother who received his PhD at 29 years old. He was born in 1896. He was born 30 years after emancipation, got a PhD in mathematics, uh, was one of only 28 doctorates in mathematics in the whole country. Now, our children need to understand that. They need to see that the spirit of, of Brother Cox is in them. Uh, Ernest Wilkins, a brother of mathematics, he, this brother got his PhD in mathematics from the University of Chicago at 19. He worked on the Manhattan Project. Every time you see this stuff about this United States talking about the Manhattan Project, you don't see no blood hanging out there with all the scientists. You don't see that image of yourself as part of that experiment that allowed the United States to become a world power because of his mathematical genius. In fact, if you think about it, he was a, a PhD at 19, and if there is a Doogie Howser, it's a black man. It's a black man. But you don't see no brother showing that role. We need, to, we need to see the importance of our image and our interest. We need to see the importance of our image and interest in these things if we are to engage in the second task of curricula, which is to create desire for education. There's a brother named David Hedgley. You can go to any, any physicist, go to NASA and ask who is David Hedgley. They won't tell you. But if you go into their formula and go into their, into, into their, their, uh, their, um, uh, their scientific documents, what you find is that David Hedgley was the recipient of a NASA Space Act Award for his breakthrough in computer graphics. Hedgley is the brother who figured out to make three-dimensional graphics on computers. So our children are playing around with Pac-Man and all this stuff and don't realize they couldn't do that. It wasn't for what's called in mathematics the Hedgley solution. You ask white folk who was, what's the Hedgley solution, and they can't tell you. You ask these Japanese who are running around talking about black people of lowering the educational potential of America, uh, ask them who are benefiting from this brother's genius. We need to begin to understand that so we can tell the black children that we are in this stuff at the highest levels. And we're not in it just as a dark skin.
understand the coach gives you the general design for living and patterns for interpreting reality, then not only do we motivate them, but we send them to the heights of excellence. And they ain't just brothers, they were sisters. Marjorie Brown, in 1949, received a PhD from the University of Michigan in mathematics. Evelyn Granville, in 1949, from Yale in mathematics. Gloria uh, Hewitt, in 1949, from mathematics. Uh, the sister named Eleanor Green uh, uh, Jones received a PhD as, in quote, a single parent raising two children at the same time. Go ahead. She was able to do that, not because she was a struggling woman whose man cut her loose or, or turned his back on her. She was able to do that because she drugged up deep down in her Africanity and understood that she could master all they had to master and still be responsible for producing the next generation of African people. And black women have always done that. We need to see that so we don't focus on the wrong thing. We begin to focus on the wrong thing and begin doing all this debating about who done who wrong. We begin following other, other folks' crises about who done things wrong. See, we can look at this in terms of everything. Now, I just gave you mathematics. You can look at it in terms of, in terms of art. In terms of art, the importance of art is not to look at how do black men and women draw stuff on the wall or how do we create music, but to recognize that art is a medium that expresses in concrete terms the invisible spirit and intention of a people. And so African art, black art, becomes important to infuse in the curriculum because we're able to demonstrate that there is an unbroken continuity in African art from ancient Kemet and even pre-Kemet up until the time you see a brother doing graffiti on a wall in the subway. And if he understands that tradition and understands that, then African art is infused with the spirit of African people. Uh, the functional continuity of African art is important because we need to see and understand the importance of symbolism. That's our language. Symbolism is our language. It gives meaning to the innate knowledge. You see, symbolism gives meaning to the innate knowledge. And what the African artist does is concretize in visual expression that innate knowledge. That's why, that's why folk would go to Africa and steal our stuff and come back and say, this is Cubanism and this is stuff. And they, they'd be just taking stuff and come back and just say it's there. And, and what, what do we do? We say, ain't no problem it's going to create something else. I mean, it wasn't really no big deal because, because we knew that the innate knowledge the innate knowledge has no limits. So we can give up some stuff to them and go on and create something else. And we do it all the time. African people do it all the time. We do it in language. They take on our language. You know, they take on our language styles. We give it up. So you all have that stuff. We go on and create something else. Create something else. And, and they run around down here trying to write the stuff down, figure out how they can codify it, break the code. And don't understand that it's about innate knowledge. We create dance. And they go and they figure out how to put the things on the floor and put them on the floor and they try to do that stuff so they, they get it down and they can, they can do it. I, listen, please understand, this is not a racist statement. They are very good at imitation. But very poor at creation. And so, and, and, and the psychological trick bag, the psychological trick bag is they got us thinking that we have arrived when we copy them imitating us. They're not realizing the creator is us. So we, so we need to begin to see that. You can do it in science. You can look at the hard science and begin to ask the questions about what was the science and technology of the Nile Valley. You can look and ask the question about what did the ancients mean by sacred science? And what was the sacred science stuff? Is that religion? Is that occult stuff? And they want to tell us that it's a religion or it's occult stuff. But sacred science was in fact the recognition that the material world and the spiritual world are one and the same. And that is the energy of the spiritual world that we can manipulate as a perceptible and ponderable understanding that becomes a science of knowing. Yeah. So we begin to recognize that we can build upon and we can help our children recognize that science is a sacred obligation. That science is a sacred obligation. It's not just about uh, dealing with things that have no relationship that are so abstract and objective that they have no relationship to the human spirit, that it is a sacred obligation. Looking at science in terms of the African use of time, our creation of the calendar, how do we create a calendar that was demarcated in 365 days and in fact have a rhythm that was not bound by time? That is a contradiction. We do time and don't do time at the same time. We are in time and outside of time at the same time. How do we 
begin to understand those phenomena in terms of recognizing the African issue. Looking at the Dogon astronomical sciences, understanding African uh, ener energetics, understanding the African roots of metallurgy, understanding the African roots of electrical engineering. All that are tasks that we can use to simply infuse in the curriculum African content. African content. And that's exciting, that's important, but the real deal for me is infusing the curricula, the educational experience in African intent. Yes. Because all that stuff that we can see, we can document, we can show as important and, and part of our contributions to human civilization, we're driven by a belief in the task of reproducing and refining the best of ourselves, the intent, understanding what it was in terms of the nature of African men and women. And I want to suggest to you this evening that that can be clarified by recognizing the issue of culture as married to identity. Identity. Because in psychology, the principle of identity is really the concept we use to reveal, that, that, that is used for us to understand that identity reveals and determines the form in which a people's human energy is structured. You see, if you look at electricity, Electricity is out there. It cannot be comprehended until we structure that electricity into a form that looks like a light bulb. And then we recognize electricity. And so identity does the same thing. Identity really is, reveals and determines the structure in which our human energy, I'm sorry, the form in which our human energy is structured. So what is the structure that we're trying to capture is not the question. It is what is the energy that's going to be infused in a structure. The energy is African energy. The structure becomes our black bodies. So you can infuse into this form the energy that is African, and that raises the question of ten. intent. Uh, identity in its most, the most simplistic terms is the component of oneself that is most closely to who you are in how you are. When you talk about an African identity, you're talking about a who and a how. Who you are is associated with this identity and how you are. And so we know in our communities, when we see a, a, a black person whose, I, whose energy has been put into a form that is non-African, then we start talking about them. You know, saying, look at me. He, he, he walk all tight and stiff, he talk all properly, you know, he ain't got no rhythm. And we, we can identify the person, we can begin to talk, and we used to play games about him. You know, he's so stiff, you know, and he's, you know, we talk bad about him because he, 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 he's doing, oh yes, or wrong. Well, I just think that you people, and, and uh, I don't understand, and uh, it ain't about race anymore, it's, it's, it's individualism, and that we have to be universal, and we have to understand that we're all human. And we say, what kind of shit is this? <laughs> And you see, you see that, response, that response has to do with the fact that we can recognize that the form is there. The form is there, I meaning there's a black man or woman there, but the energy that is in that form is alien. Don't feel right. Don't feel right. The light bulb is not glowing right. You see, so, so it's important to see. It is important to see that this question of identity is tied to is tied to the question of intent in curricula. Because what we're really talking about is that there is a character yes. to African people. Mm -hmm. There's a character to African people. And by definition, character is the mark of something, the, th the thing that allows you to recognize it. Mm -hmm. Character is the thing that signifies one's distinctive quality. Yes. So when we're talking about the African character, we're talking about all those things that allow us to, that, that signify the distinct quality of what it is to be African. And we got a whole bunch of stuff that we, that we can talk about in simplistic terms that is our character. I mean, our rhythms, the way we, the way we stand is, a, is, is part of our character. I mean, I, I, I point out all the time that, that in terms of black men, but black women as well, that black people always, African people always stand with the left foot forward. I mean, that's our comfortable, that, and the hip is right. You know, when we stand the left foot forward. And if you stand with the right foot forward, you got to pose. You got to really take two, figure out how to get the balance when the right foot is forward. 
But you just walk out on the street and do left foot head. <laughs> <laughs> we do that naturally, it's just a rhythm there. That's those distinctive qualities. Those distinctive qualities have to do with our form being driven by the proper energy. Yeah. Being driven by the proper energy. You can look at the, and, I, and, and I, 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 I've been pointing out that when you see brothers on the street, the stuff that we create with our bodies is a grammar. It's a grammar. You know, my sister put her hand on her, on her hip. That's a message. There's a meaning. There's symbolism in that. That's a grammar. We know what it is now because this represents the Masonic square or the sign of righteousness. And the only time sister puts her hand on her hip is when we ain't done something right. She don't walk around hand on her hip. You know, but let brothers get out of pocket and say, my sister put her hand on her hip. And she does what my daughters have told me I can't do. But I gotta figure out what the symbolism is. But she does the next thing, she be going. <laughs> we can't do it. We can't do it, but we certainly recognize it. And we know what it means. It means brother men and there's some stuff out of pocket. And so we go through all kinds of stuff. We do we do the begging waddle. You know, the brother had a begging waddle. We say, we say, come on, baby. This is Give me stuff and you slow me down. <laughs> you understand that that bagging water is interesting. We all recognize it, but what is that wobble in physics? What's the rhythm? What does that mean? What's the energy that's being set up in terms of the communication? You see, and we, and we do the bagging water with wobble. The sister say, you know, she say, oh shit, come on, why don't you do right? You know, she's doing that stuff. Or, and then we know it as, as brothers and as male relation, if we come off someplace and we done did stuff real, real out of pocket, sister comes standing up with this hand on her hip and this hand on her hip. And when she put both hands on her hip, the grandma says, don't do no begging, just say, I'm sorry. She said, hey girl, I'm sorry. And it's, it's, in, and it's in that communication that we see the distinctive qualities of the form that is driven by an energy that is an African identity. So we need to recognize that because those are things that we got to begin to say we must formally, given that we are not in salt water anymore, we must formally teach our children to recognize. Because in the natural swimming in this environment, they don't pick it up. And so when, 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 when grandma would just look at you, just look at you, we knew, we knew to put the computers on and try to figure out which of the things we did wrong she gonna ask us about. You know, we just try to figure out which one we want. We want to confess, but we don't want to confess to something that she may not have known about. And so we run, the, we run through all the stuff we did wrong because just by her giving us a look, you see? And so, but now, this generation of black children, this generation of African children, you can look at them through your eyes. Because they've been swimming in non-salt water. They don't understand the character of Africanness. They don't understand the energy. They have the energy, but they don't have the form and the symbolisms that allow them to see that. And that's the intent part of education that we need to begin to address. We need to look at the mark of a people. What's the mark? Our mark is not only the fact that we are melanin, that we are black. That's a mark. That's a clear mark. But that physical mark, that material mark, is the same as the spiritual mark. Because the spirit and the matter are the same, one and the same. And so we see the mark of our color, we have to be able to see the mark of our spirits. And educational systems cannot violate the mark of our spirits. And so it's not just the content, it is the intent. We have to begin to talk about and understand how do we do that. And, 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 and there are some things that I think we can address and begin to reclaim and rescue based upon uh, the understanding that it is our responsibility and our obligation to, uh, to bring about the intention of education is to reproduce and refine the best of, of our Africanness. And, and, and clearly the, 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 the principles that our ancestors laid down are the best and most purest place to begin because they're uncontaminated. Mm -hmm. They're uncontaminated. And so we got to go to a source that is not contaminated if we're going to ever recreate the mark of our spirit. If we get some stuff that is a, that is a caricature of us that's been contaminated, then we can recreate, but we're not real, recreating the real deal. 
we're cre recreating some stuff that has been contaminated. Uh, and, 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 the, and the principles of, of, uh, of ancient Kemet, uh, for me, are a place to start. We can look at, for instance, that the ancient ones said that, that education development was really a process of transformation. It's about transformation. It's about change. That you engage in education in order to change. And in, 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 the, in, in the sacred text of our ancestors, the change was really how do you produce humans to become more godlike, to become, if you will, gods. And that, that we did it so well that when those folk who came into our systems of mystery were so awed by us that they got confused and thought we were gods. And they ran, ran back thinking that we were gods. And we were just blood to ten hay. <laughs> and they were saying, this wow, and they ran from we gods and, 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 and take, took our systems and tried to recreate them someplace else. And, uh, and confused the deal, and then and then really brought it back to us, saying, "This is what y'all are doing." And we said, "Okay, that's what we're doing," and got confused because they brought back an interpretation of what we were doing that was wrong. But because they came back it, with it in the book, we later on, us now, thought it was right. So what we got was the Greek philosophy in the book that said, "This is what you all were doing," and in fact, they were because they were affirmative action children didn't quite have the technical skills to comprehend what we're about. And so they gravitated to the material piece of it and left out the spiritual piece of it. And so then we got now as a legacy an analysis that is elegant and complex dealing with the material world. But we have nothing from them dealing with the spiritual world. It is only in our ancestry that we can find that. It is only in the fact that if we look at pre-dynastic commit, there was at least 40,000 years of, of, of information experimentation that our ancestors engaged in. And I tell my students, think about that, 40,000 years. We could take 5,000 years and be on the wrong path. We could take another 5,000 years and play. We can take another 10,000 years and give up on the deal and still got 20,000 years to get it right. See, so the amount of time that we had doing this stuff, we worked it out. But we don't go back to our source. We go back to those people who studied our sources and didn't understand it and left us a legacy of half-truths, of incomplete information. So we have to go back to our source. When we go back to that, what I have found in, 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 in some recent research that I'm, I'm being led to, because uh, I think the ancestors lead us to stuff. Uh, and so you're being led to. There's not no systematic quest for knowledge. You're being, you're being led to, and they just make books jump out off the wall at you. You're going to say, I'm not ready for that one. <laughs> you're going to put it down. You ain't ready for it. Now, that's real. You're going to do that. But what the ancestors, what, what our ancestors said is that there were three aspects of life. Simple, simple, elegant stuff. There were three aspects of life that were part of the transformative process. First thing they argue, the argue for is that, that, that education really was a transformation, but the transformation was an alchemical, alchemical transformation of initiation to perfection. I want you to hold on to that because that's going to come back to you uh, in your dreams, maybe, but clearly in literature. There was an alchemical transformation of initiation to perfection. And the alchemical transformation was taking humans from a lesser material being and transforming humans into a greater spiritual being. That was the alchemical transformation. Those affirmative action kids got there and saw that and misunderstood it and ran back home and said alchemistry is to take base material, base matter, and change it into gold. And so they're running around trying to figure out a piece of lead they can put into the toilet, they can chant over it, they can do something to make this, this lead turn into gold because they can comprehend the material world. And so their transformation was about taking one matter, one material state, and putting it into another material state of more value. When our ancestors said the real deal is to take material man, material woman, and to transform them into gods, to transform them into the greater spiritual being. And, 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 and the process was simple, even though it sounds spooky sometimes, esoteric sometimes, but the process was simple. The transformative process, they argue, was that there were three aspects of life, desire, thought, and action. 
And that holds true today. I, I tell any brother and sister, think about what happens when you're out there dealing. Just on a, on, a, on a personal basis. You see a sister, first thing you're thinking about, what first thing happens is desire. <laughs> or no desire. But it's a desire phenomena. And if the desire, the next thing that happens is what? Thought. We start figuring out how I'm going to turn the corner on this deal. You know, how am I going to, how am I going to broker this issue? You know, what, can I, what, can I, what can I do? But it's a thought process. And once I get to the thought, then the issue is action. I step off on into it. So it's desire, thought, and action. Those, in every single situation, you find those attributes. Those are the living aspects, desire, thought, and action. But the ancestors said that those were the what? The general base material conditions. You had to transform them into their higher spiritual condition. And so desire gets transformed into pure love. No longer desire. Thought gets transformed into clear understanding. You're not just thinking, you're understanding the deal. And then finally, action. And this is the most profound and important piece. Action gets transformed into acts in service or sacrifice to benefit the whole. Not oneself. And in that process, you become from less material being to greater spiritual being. Once you operate on a plane of pure love for African people, once you operate on a clear understanding of the conditions that impact on African people, once you operate on every act as an act of sacrifice and service to benefit African people, you have become perfected. then becomes how do we shape, force, demand that the educational systems that are charged with the responsibility of educating our children engage in that process? Because that's the intent piece. Wow. See, it ain't just about Euclid. It ain't just about Ptolemy. It ain't just about Imhotep. It ain't just about Hatshepsut. It ain't just about Hypatia. It's about the fact that Hatshepsut was Hatshepsut because she was in a process that allowed her to reach from desire to pure love, from thought to clear understanding, from act to acts of sacrifice and service to the benefit of her kind. That's what made her Hatshepsut. So we have to talk about the creation of the intent. And it seems to me that we can do that. It's a major undertaking. It's going to be a war because now I'm suggesting to you a whole different kind of pedagogical procedure. It's a whole different kind of issue now. It ain't about can I, can I educate black kids so they can pass the SAT, so they can go to college, so they can graduate, so they can get their BMW, their home, their, their, their girlfriend, and move away from the community. It's about when that child is through with the education process, its instinct, its energy is formed into a structure that automatically does stuff, because we do, does stuff in the service and in sacrifice to benefit black people. Can't do nothing else. Yes. Can't do nothing else. Don't know how to do nothing else because they become perfected. They have become perfected. And the final thing that I, that I, I want to share with you before I, I stop is that it seems to me that the skills that have to occur in the education process, or, or more correctly, the criteria that we have to submit to the educational process if it is to meet the challenge of content and intent, is that the educational system has to be able to answer the three basic questions of identity. Remember, identity is in fact the, 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 the is when our energy is structured into a particular form. But there are questions of identity that we can see, because that, that's sort of esoteric and philosophical. There's some questions that we can address that, that uh, that Malana Karinga has offered us that I think are valuable are the questions, the basic identity that the schoolhouse should, should be able to leave our children with the ability to answer is the question of who am I? They should not go through the educational system and not be able to answer the simple question, who are you? Who am I? The second question that, of identity that's important is for them to be able to answer the question, am I really who I am? You know, and I point out that if the educational system leads us to the point where we believe that it is a fashion statement to put green contacts in our eyes because we want to look prettier, then we are not answering the question properly, am I really who I am? 
If we look in the mirror and see Frankenstein and think that's pretty, then the educational system has not educated us to the point that we can answer the question, am I really who I am? And the third, final, third and final question of identity is, am I all I ought to be? Am I all I ought to be? I suggest that in terms of the question of who am I, the answer is yes, if the educational system is built upon the values, the history, the traditions, and the cultural precepts of African people. That's the infusion, that's the inclusion piece. Am I, all, am I really who I am? The answer is yes, if the educational system is operating to the extent that the educational experience employs, understands, internalizes, and reflects the cultural authenticity of the African community. And am I all I ought to be? The answer for the educational system is yes, if we can say to the extent that the educational experience possesses and self, and this is important, and self-consciously applies, infuses, includes the cultural standards and meanings of the African world as the engine that drives the educational experience. The final point is that the question of am I all I ought to be has to be ultimately no. That at every moment in time, you are never all you ought to be. The transformative process of perfection is eternal and continual. And so at every level, each black child has to get better tomorrow than he was today. But fundamentally and most importantly, every generation of African people must get better, must reproduce and refine the best that is itself. Hotel Brothers and Sisters. If, if you give me one minute, we will take about Thomas Sobel, and he's an SOB with an L on it, so S-O-B-O-L, and it's Commissioner Thomas Sobel, New York State Education Department, New York State Education Department, Education Building, Washington Avenue, Albany, New York. Washington Avenue, Albany, New York, 12234. And it's very important that you send even just a note telling them that you want in this curricula the material that Dr. Sanford, Dr. Jeffries, and others has put forth as the curricula of inclusion and use some of the data that Dr. Noble has given you tonight to describe why you want, and then reach into yourself and get the other pure stuff and put it in a note, okay? You have got to make a statement, otherwise we are just as guilty of murder as they are. And we can no longer leave it for Dr. Noble or Dr. Small or other people to take care of your business, and when we become the Christ and the dead lambs, you wonder why they did that to that brother. Now take, this is the time when those of us who say, I'm not biting the bullet for you no more. Take responsibility for yourself. I will not let him sacrifice himself but so much. And some of us have taken the soldier responsibility. We are now going to tell those who are willing to sacrifice, we will not let you sacrifice but so much because either the body of the whole be willing to make the same sacrifice or it's better a dead carcass and out of the way. So please, I know that sounds harsh, but it is the truth. We've got to take responsibility. This is a fight that we can win this level of. It's not winning the fight, because when it gets in there, those crackers are going to fight harder than they've ever fought. 
And if you see the stuff coming at us from the paper and Creep Bob Grant on the radio attacking Dr. Jeffries and today and all of the other stuff and this Diane Ravitch witch who some of us have to deal with writing to, you got to understand that when they figured how to get control of that school system such that they could murder without firing a shot, that stuff beats the dope. You know, and so everybody in here got to tell at least three friends and give this address to them and ask them to write a note. And if you can afford, make some phone calls to the State Department of Education and demand if they don't do this thing, there won't be too much so-called education going on in New York. We have to take our kids out of the schools where we can afford to do so. And if you can't afford to do so, there's enough of us that don't have jobs that can do as much teaching about children as other people. So we have to get very serious. Otherwise, the brothers or sisters who drop out of that system and turn to drugs, maybe the one that put the bullet through your head because you think that you got a few dollars and a little bit of education, you can get away. And I hope nobody get away from the one or two who don't make it. So please take the responsibility. Let me do the sweet side now. This we've got to do for the sake of the race. If we win here in New York, they will win in California, they will win in Chicago, they will win in Atlanta, and this thing will boomerang around the country. In order to get the masters, there are certain mainstream theorists that you have to deal with. Uh, being, in, being in a master's program, you've got to get a man chicken when he wants chicken. How do you uh, propose that, that we try to address ourselves to theorists like yourself and others around the country, uh, given their posture towards our philosophy? I think that, it, and I, I, I really look at this over and over again because every year it doesn't go away. But I, my, my answer in the past has been that you should simply do the easiest, least dangerous piece of work you can do to get the degree. And then do real work when you come out. As a student, you can never win the battle of getting them to accept Afrocentric or African scholars as part of your discipline. But you should not take advantage of the theories and the thinking of African scholars as you develop yourself as an as a, as a, as a intellectual and professional. But at some point, they will hold you up forever because the bottom line is that they're going to sign on a piece of paper to say that you certified. And so the thing that I recommend students do is to figure out very quickly what is the quickest, easiest, least dangerous thing you can do to get out and then do the real work. Any more questions? Mary? Oh. Would you be, uh, Dr. Nobles, would you be kind enough just to review uh, just to review um, the Margaret Mead, you know, what was it they were looking for when they went to the so-called um, primitive people, and what was their assignment? What were they supposed to do with it? How um, was it supposed to affect us, if at all? Um, yeah, I don't have a lot of, uh, of, uh, of affection for uh, anthropology, because I think that and it's not just Margaret Mead, it's the, it's the field, it's the discipline. I think that uh, anthropology and psychology were the two disciplines that were orchestrated to destroy the African mind and, and community. And so in part, those, those uh, anthropological researchers were, were purported to, to study ancient peoples in order to learn something about modern peoples, but in actuality, they were designed to really do espionage and destruction. They brought in disease, they brought in, and they took out of those things false interpretations of our lifestyles, and then, and then defined us as, as a primitive with, a, with, with negative connotation, and not primitive as being primary, being the first human form. And so I think that, 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 that it really was a political quest. Now, now Margaret Mead, we're now learning, as we learn about a lot of those those uh, mothers and fathers of, 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 uh, of the disciplines uh, falsified a lot of stuff because when she went in there and saw the stuff, she couldn't deal with it, so she just made up stuff. Right. 
There's made up stuff, and that, that, that's, that's a typical pattern. Um, I want to thank you, uh, Dr. Noble. It was as good as it was in Atlanta, and it was good in Atlanta. I, I want you to emphasize uh, the curriculum of inclusion and the concept of inclusion because I had to substitute for a Lent Jeffries a Saturday morning. And so many people think that means a unit, you know, a lesson unit. And since we're trying to uh, move on a class action suit at some time and get some parents to sue the city because their children are not being taught the truth because there is a curriculum of exclusion. See, that's, that's the argument. There is a curriculum of exclusion, and we are only taught Western lies. And so the fight here is for the curriculum of inclusion just to teach the truth, which would begin in Africa. So I, I really want you to emphasize that because we're trying to develop this uh, legal case, and we're going to need some people to understand we're not asking for Martin Luther King units in May and Martin. Malcolm X in May 19th. Yeah, Sister Lady, you, you really did it already. I, mean, I, can, I can reflect back to you what you just said, which is the real issue, that, that it is not uh, the, the, the inclusion uh, movement, the, the, the infusion movement. In, in California, we're talking about the, the application, you know, like applied physics, there's applied culture. The uh, cultural pride, those notions are really saying that we're changing the fundamental nature of the educational experience. Yes. So it is not about a component, it is about a process. Because I think we now recognize that, that every process ends in a product. If we want the product to be African men and women, then the process has to lead to that. And so you have to infuse the process, you have to include in the process the components, the ingredients, the energy that is African in order to get an African product at the end. Uh, the final thing that I think is important to recognize is that all the, the hoopla about the, the curriculum of inclusion, the task force really gave a report, as I read it, that says we need a curriculum of inclusion. People are critiquing the task force call for a curriculum as the curriculum. It is not the curriculum. It is simply saying we're calling for. There's a need for a curriculum that includes all folk. And in our people like Ravitch are running around saying that the task force report is the curriculum and it is wanting and inferior and not a good document. And that's just immoral confusion. You said, you studied, I mean, you, you, that's transparent. You can see what that's about. Got a couple more. That's an expensive tape recorder. Hello, I'd just like to um, know I was reading an article about the um, how the Asians come over here and they get these good marks and things like that. And I would like to know um, how do we, is that a cultural thing and um, how does that cultural thing work for them? And how can we get that cultural thing to work for us? Yeah, they, they, they like to always put up the Asians as an example of, look, at the, they did it, and, and, and how come y'all can't do it? The fact of the matter is that Asians did not come here as captive victims right. of, a, of an inhuman people. Right. You know, it's, it's like, it's like the, the difference between, I mean, it's, it's, it's almost like, what will you do once you land and you've come across on a slave ship versus what do you do when you land and you came across on a love boat? Your attitude, your, your interests, your, your, your ideas are all different, you see? And so, 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 so we can't allow them to make the comparisons with us. But, but I will say that the, the Asian success is because they utilize their culture as the energy that motivates their addressing whatever problem it is. And we clearly need to do that. I mean, that's not an Asian thing. That is the fact that if you're a saltwater fish, you know how to deal with salt water. Exactly. And so you bring the salt water with you. And that we need to utilize our culture as we are confronted with any problem. I think also, however, on the, on the, on the, on the downside of the Asian success 
is that the Asians are successful in the educational experience as defined by European curriculum. They will become de-Asianized as long as they continue to be successful. If they don't look at that very carefully and not take pride in the fact that they're being successful with it, they can be successful. So you can be successful in the European curriculum if you understand that the, in, that the idea is to get the content, not the intent of it. You see? And so if they go blindly into getting the content, they're going to get the intent if they don't recognize that they have to protect their own intent. And that's the, that's the, 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 the wisdom that I think we have recognized now, is that we can get content stuff that is even European. That's all right. We can get that. What we don't want is the intent of that curriculum. And if, and if we're going to create an education experience, then we need to create one that is our content in our intent. Tiananmen Square. The ones who built that statue had the content. The one who laid them to rest had the intent. <laughs> Professor, uh, what, I'd like to ask this question. What can we as a people, uh, what can we do as a people do to get access of the knowledge of our ancestors for those 40,000 years or more? Uh, we feel that this may be the, uh, the key to our true liberation and, re and regeneration back to life. That's a, that's a very good and important question. I, mean, I think, that, you know, think that it means that we have to make study as a practice that is a lifestyle issue. That, that just as we get up and brush our teeth we, as, as a lifestyle issue that we're trained to do, we have to make study a lifetime, a lifestyle issue, and that the information is there. We need to begin to dig and to use that. I mean, to, to give an example that, that uh, I don't like to do because it, 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 it uh, gives recognition sometimes in the wrong place. There's a ritual in, 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 uh, in, Hebrew, in the Hebrew community that when a, when a child is born and lives in the household, that they put um, honey on a book on the book, and then the child tastes the honey and internalizes that the book is something sweet and valuable. The issue is not to feed the child, but to see the book as important. We need to create rituals that see education and study as important and as something that is delicious. Something that's delicious. But the other thing, and so that's the, that's the material stuff. That's the visible stuff. That's the matter. The other stuff is that we have to open up our beings to the spirit so that it comes out of us. See, it's in us. There's no, there's no thought, no knowledge, no information that is not ingrained in every single cell of our bodies. We have to begin the process of diet and, and, and exercise and physical beingness that opens ourselves up so that we can get revelation. See, there's revelation and then there's research. We need to do research, but we need to allow stuff to be revealed to us because the ancestors are out there throwing it at us. All the time, put it in front of us, and he'll trip over that, and then he'll get up and look at it, and then he'll do something with it. So we need to begin to, be, to allow ourselves to have revelation as well as the research. This is the last, last question. Uh, I've been reading uh, Obenga uh, in um, the book uh, Africa Revisited. Would you just, it's very difficult reading, okay? And would you just sort of give us some idea of what you think about the uh, his propositions. My spirit tells me that there's something there and it's good. I don't know what it is yet. I, I'm still reading it myself right now. I think that, I think that uh, it's, it's critical that we study that. Uh, Obinga makes the argument that, that the, 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 the primary substance was matter that really was in the form of water. Yeah. And, um, and uh, then it transforms itself into spirit and then back to matter. I think that the analogy is an interesting, intriguing one because water as matter is the substance that has a transformative quality that can take any form. Yeah. It can be steam or spirit. It can be liquid or water. It can be ice or matter. So the thing that he's identifying as matter is really Fluid. It's not really matter. It's matter and not matter at the same time. So I think we're, I, I'm, I'm studying it right now and working through that. 
But I agree with him that the, the, the notion of water and the egg, which is really water or substance surrounded with matter, are important symbolism yes. in African cosmology. And we need to figure that out. But I don't, I'm not ready to say it is matter as Europeans or the Western world has defined matter. But we're using European language, so we, the closest thing to the substance is matter, but substance and spirit are really the same stuff. Yeah. See, so it's hard, to, it's hard to get the language to capture that. Yeah. Yeah. So leave with the idea that I don't know. <laughs> Thank you, Doctor. Let me give a very, very special thanks for all the help to make it possible that Dr. Noble got here. First, to Dr. Noble, who made a lot of sacrifice to be here today and everything else to make it possible. Let me give thanks also to the Organization for the Study of Classical African Civilization, ASCAC, for doing something at the last minute and a very positive, strong thing. And thanks to you. And thanks to you for coming on such short notice in such large numbers to hear this product. Thank you very much. <laughs>